Well, they say in America, if that doesn't light your fire, your wood must be very wet. <laughs> that was wonderful singing. And to watch you, it was just a real inspiration. And it's a joy to be back with you again at the lifeboat. And it's a joy to be able to bring Yvonne, of course. She follows me most places I go and is with me. And we have been serving the Lord now for uh, 50 years in double harness. Give us another month and we'll be celebrating our golden wedding anniversary. And of course, when that started, just a couple of years before, Bertie and Pat had come into the kingdom. And this year is also my 60th anniversary in the kingdom. I was saved when I was 16 and a half. So now you know how my age. It's a joy to have Yvonne here to share in these wonderful meetings. But it's a special joy to welcome on your behalf our sister Anita McDonald. We first brought her to Northern Ireland uh, some 25 years or thereabouts. I haven't just really worked it out. But I first heard her when I was doing a convention in Fraserburgh in Scotland. And when I heard her sing, I said, oh my, if I could bring that young lady across to Northern Ireland, I'm sure the people would be blessed and enjoy uh, hearing her. So we were the first to bring her across the Irish Sea. From then till now, she has been backwards and forwards many times, and she has been singing in many different places. And of course, you have had her here at the grand opening of the new church, and that I'm sure was a real blessing to you all. So again, Anita, it's great to have you with us, and I know Bertie has already said so, but come ahead, and she's going to bring us one message in song uh, this morning for the sake of time, but she will be our guest and resident singer through the week ahead. Uh, many of the songs that you will hear this week are her own songs written by herself uh, at times of inspiration and blessing, and Anita, come right away. And uh, just lovely to have you. You want to say a few words, dear? Thank go you. ahead. Just go ahead. Yes, it's Speak lovely. Lovely to be back. Can't believe it's been all those years since I was here before. But I wish you a very, very blessed, happy anniversary. And I pray that our gracious God will grant you so, so many more. It's really good to be with you. I bring the tidings and the greetings of Bethesda Church in Fraserburgh. I know they'll be praying for me. I have a wee prayer group in my home on a Thursday morning, and they're all praying, and praying for the people here and the work here in Dungannon. So thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation, and thank you so much for all your hospitality. Um, it is, it's just such a joy to be here and to sit there and hear all that singing, just praising the Lord. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you.
<clears throat> well, that's our prayer, and that's our desire, that you will come and get in touch with a fresh outpouring of God's love. His love outpoured is the great blessing that he waits in store for all who will trust him. And those who trust him wholly will find him wholly true. How good it is to be in the presence of a living Savior, an exalted Lord, and he's seated at God's right hand. He's interceding for us. His yearning heart longs for his people to be as close to him as they can possibly be. That's why he sent his Spirit to bring us close to himself and to open our eyes and our hearts and to touch every part of our lives. We're going to read a few verses today from the Gospel according to St. John. We're reading from John's Gospel, chapter 14, and reading from verse 15. John chapter 14 and verse 15 to verse 18, and then from verse 23 to verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 15. And the Lord Jesus is the speaker. The scene is set in the upper room. His earthly ministry is coming to its climax, but he has got something that he really wants to share with his disciples that he has not really shared with them before this moment in time, but now feels it is incumbent upon him to let them into this wonderful news. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Then verse 25, 23 rather, verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, who is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And we shall conclude there at the 26th verse, and pray now that God will bless his precious word to our hearts. Yes, it is a joy to share in your anniversary. This is your 34th anniversary, which makes it your opal anniversary. An opal anniversary, an opal stone is a very beautiful and precious stone, and for the faithful recipient of an opal stone, it will always wear a beauty. And I pray that your ministry, Bertie, and those who share with you in the leadership, that your ministry will be always anointed, beautiful and blessed, and be a glory to Jesus Christ, and that the whole witness of the ministry here will continue to go from strength to strength. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Our Father, we come to thank and praise Thee today for milestones in our lives. Yes, Lord, it has been a milestone in our nation this past week. And today, Lord, we realize that our nation is focused on 70 amazing years of reign for our gracious lady, Queen Elizabeth II, our Queen. And we pray today for her, Lord, and pray for the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to rest upon her and on her life for the moments and hours and years that may remain for her. We pray also, Lord, for the lifeboat ministry today 
on this day of multiple anniversaries as we are thinking of our lives and the ministry now. And so we pray, Lord, that on this, the anniversary that tops them all, the coming of the Spirit, O oh Lord, we pray, descend, O oh gracious dove, thy mighty Spirit of God, Spirit of faith, come down. Reveal the things of God. Make to us now the Godhead known, and witness with the blood. Tis thine the blood to apply, and give us eyes to see. Thou didst for every sinner die, and thou hast surely died for me. And so we pray, gracious Spirit, thou art already welcomed, and we pray now bless thy precious word to our hearts, and make me a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the Master's use, and prepared unto every good work and word. Now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If there are four words for my message for you in the moments that remain, it would be these. The Comforter has come. The Comforter has come. And we were reading about the promise of the Comforter. Of all the promises in the Bible, there is just one promise that is referred to as the promise. And you find that at the end of Luke's Gospel in chapter 24, where Jesus speaks about the promise of the Father. And the promise of the Spirit's coming is a unique promise in the Word of God. To us now today, it is a promise fulfilled. And on this Pentecost Sunday, we can say the Comforter has come. When Queen Victoria first visited Scotland, a beacon was lit in Edinburgh that then sent a signal to Stirling. And then the beacon being lit there sent a signal to Inverness, and from there to distant Caithness. And so the whole land was to learn four words. The Queen has come. Thank God today there's a beacon that was lit in the upper room at Pentecost, who announced to the world, all around, and to all those who were there, He has come. And there's a lovely old hymn, and it has a question. Has He come to you? Has He come to you? Has the Holy Ghost come to you? And my emphasis this morning is on this wonderful blessing, of the Holy Ghost coming. You know, it's very interesting because on Pastor Birdie's table, there was a book laid this morning and I saw it when I walked in, The Guest of the Soul by Samuel Logan Brengel. You know something? I think it was either last night or early this morning that I drew that book out of my shelves of all the books that I have. And all the books of Samuel Logan Brengel that, are be, that I possess, I drew out the guest of the soul. And it's very appropriate, that title, because he is the holy guest. The old Saxon word for ghost and guest come from the same root word. And so we could very aptly say, the holy guest has come. And my friends today, I want to make him the supreme guest of my soul. I want to say to him this morning at the beginning of this week of great anniversary services, Thou holy guest, find a royal welcome in my heart and take possession of my spirit, my soul, and my body. Take possession of my whole being. Let my life be a living flame. Let my talents be harnessed by the Lord. Let my mind be sanctified to His glorious will, and every part of my being be at His feet. My dear people, that's what I would like you to do in this week, to make a covenant with God afresh, to lay yourself at His feet and say, Come, Holy Spirit, take possession of me completely. Come, O oh come, great Spirit, come. 
Let a mighty work be done. I am waiting for the fire. I am waiting for the fire. Come, Holy Spirit, come. You know, the prominence, the biblical prominence of the Spirit is very significant. There is no other major religion in the world, no other but Christianity, that is anything that corresponds to the doctrine of the Spirit. When we speak of the doctrine of the Spirit, we are speaking of someone divine, eternal, personal, and powerful who comes to dwell within the people of God to embody himself in the people who are the body of Christ and to bring to them all that Jesus is. He is Jesus' other self. He has come to make real in us everything that the Savior has purchased for us on Calvary's cross. He has come to make real in us every characteristic of the Lord Jesus so that the nature of the eternal Christ becomes my nature. And as Charles Wesley said, Thy nature, gracious Lord, impart. Come quickly from above. Write thy new name upon my heart, thy new best name of love. Did you notice the, the significant uh, interaction of that concept in the song that Anita was singing about a new vision, a new baptism, a new day dawning, and a new day of divine love outpoured? Well, that's all in Pentecost. That's all in Pentecost. The prominence of the Spirit is found in the fact that we have got this book today. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. This book is the gift, God-given gift of the Lord through the Spirit to the church. And in its original documents, it's the very breathing of God. It's inspired and brought down to us and treasured and translated now into language that we can understand. And when we read it, God speaks to me. His Spirit imparts life to the Word, to my soul. Of course, my dear people, the Lord Jesus in giving Himself did not offer himself up of himself, but it says he was offered up by the Spirit unto the Father. And thank God today when he was raised, he was raised by the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God had his finger on every momentous event of Christian truth and Christian doctrine and biblical revelation. And that's why today, he is so vitally important. And it was Maynard James who has now gone to be with the Lord who said, with what tender awe and amazement we should think and dwell on the ministry and work of the Spirit. Yes, my dear people, I could say much more about it than that, but for the sake of time, I want to keep on the move, not keep you too late and let you get away so that you can hopefully come back to us in the evening. But the significance of the Spirit is in that there are 25 different names that are given to the Spirit in the Word. Over 90 times in Scripture, the Holy Spirit. Douglas Crossman, who was a dear friend of ours, who has just gone home to be with the Lord a couple of years ago, 2019. I only learned this just uh, very recently. We couldn't find him. We were trying to track him down, but uh, we couldn't get any information. And then Brother Gilbert just happened to send me a message. said, did you know that Brother Crossman has gone home to be with the Lord? He was 88 years of age. And uh, he said one time, you know, his uh, mother-in-law... Mrs. J.O. Fraser. J.O. Fraser was Douglas's father-in-law, Eileen's parents, and they were greatly used in revival in China amongst the Lisu tribes people. And uh, the book that's written about it is called Mountain Rain. But, uh, you know, she said to Douglas, a youngish man with all his theological degrees, why is the Holy Spirit called the Holy Spirit? 
And he thought, well, I wonder what the answer to that is. Well, that's just what he's been called. She said, Douglas, he's called the Holy Spirit because he is the Holy Spirit. Yes, my dear people. And everything that he puts his hand on, he wants to impart his very nature into that that he puts his hand on. He wants to make it holy. <laughs> yes. And so the vessels in the temple tabernacle were holy vessels. The tabernacle was sanctified and the glory cloud came down and it was set apart for God. God's house is to be a holy house, my friend. And God's people are to be a holy people. Isn't that right? Be ye holy, for I am holy. He's called the Holy Spirit 90 times in the Bible. 25 different titles for him. And so many times, 350 times in Scripture, we read about the Spirit. 86 in the Old and 210 in the New. Isn't the whole doctrine of the church, the whole Bible of the church, it is impregnated with this emphasis. And it is only but right that we should think about him on this wonderful day, Pentecost Sunday. The prominence of the Spirit, the biblical prominence. But there is then more relative and relevant to us, there is the personal presence of the Spirit. The personal presence of the Spirit. It's not enough, my dear people, to have an intellectual concept of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. What he wants is a living, vital, throbbing, internal ministry and life within us. Thousands of people will say, I believe in the Holy Ghost today. But they don't know him. They don't know him. They're not born again of the Spirit of God. They're not in the kingdom. They're not in the body of the church. And you are here this morning, perhaps, and you say, well, you know, Eric, I don't really, I don't really feel anything that you're talking about. That's because you're probably spiritually dead. Maybe you're really almost feeling sleepy. Well, I, I could understand that a little bit <laughs> because it's kind of warm in here. And maybe you've been on the go for a while. I started this morning after half five, so I'll be needing a little snooze this afternoon perhaps. But you're here this morning and the living Spirit of God is here to bring mighty life into your life. And if you read the lives of people like we've been speaking about, Samuel Logan Brangle, Samuel Chadwick, uh, F.B. Mayer, I could go on, D.L. Moody, not just within the Methodistic uh, concept alone, but within the church of the notables of our Christian history, there was a coming of the Spirit upon their lives that somehow brought them into a life of ministry that was characterized by unction and power and conviction and enthusiasm. And the Lord wants to give each one of us that same kind of quality of life. If we go to the care home. The people in it are alive. If we go to the school playground, the people in it are alive. But it's a very different quality of life. And some people have the geriatric level. There's others who have the playground level, who are dynamic, vibrant, but others are just kind of trundling along. This would be a great day, my dear brother, sister, to open up to the ministry of the Spirit in your life, to let Him come in and take away everything that dulls and dampens and stymies your life, and to release you to serve Him with zeal and fervor from this day onward. And so he comes to us as a personal visitor, a holy guest today, a promised presence. I mentioned that. The beauty about it is that he has come as a permanent presence. In the Old Testament, he came and departed. He came for special events. But the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going away. 
but he will come and we will come and we will make our abode with him forever. He has come to abide. He abides. He abides. Hallelujah, he abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way for the comforter abides with me. If a man love me, he will keep my commandments. We will come unto him and make our abode with him forever. Everything moves and moved from the intermittent to the permanent with Pentecost. And thank God today as I look back in my life as a young man, having sought the Lord and then having sat under the ministry of some of the giants like Dr. Sidney Martin, through whom Bertie and Pat were moved by God in that convention, that Whit Convention in Bundorn. I was, he was my theological uh, tutor, teacher in Bible college, lovely, wonderful man, Dr. Sidney Martin, and Duncan Campbell, and so many others that were part and parcel of Yvonne in our lives as young people uh, that the Lord gave us a focus to put our lives on the altar for God. And I will not forget, friends, today, I will not forget when God came down upon my life in an outpouring of power three years after I was converted and took me as I was, yielding, needing, desiring, and came to possess me completely as if liquid fire had come upon my being. And I, who was naturally very shy and very retiring, God opened up the doors of opportunity and called me from the farm and called me to ministry. And from then till now, 1965, I've been preaching from this wonderful book, the Bible. And my life and my ministry and my spirit is as keen for the Lord Jesus now as it has been in all the years. And I love him with all my heart. And my life is at his feet for whatever he has for me. Would you join me to let the Lord have his way in your life even today? There's no rest. There's no joy, peace, like letting the Lord have his way. Put your life in his hands. Rest secure in his plans. Let the Lord, let the Lord have his way. Young man, God has a plan for you. There is a bigger life. There is a bigger ministry. There is a grander scheme in the hands of Jesus and in the purpose of the Master for your life. And he's looking for you. He wants you to put your life on the altar for him and let the fire fall. Let the fire fall. It is a personal presence. Thank God today I'm not speaking about energy, not speaking about something that flows in wires like electricity. I'm speaking about a person, a distinct person in the Trinity, something that is someone who can teach, guide, reveal, the one who can be grieved, the one who can be silenced or quenched, the one who can be lied to. Pastor Bertie was praying and asking the Lord to forgive us for some of these things. Maybe you found yourself in that prayer. It's time to line up. It's time to kneel down. It's time to come and put that behind. One who can be blasphemed and against whom can be committed the only sin that can never be forgiven in any world. It is the only he whom man can sin against with an unforgivable sin. Maynard James again said, with what tender awe and reverence we should stand before the third person of the adorable Trinity. The Holy Spirit a promised presence, 
permanent presence, personal presence, a purifying presence. Samuel Chadwick said, the supreme need of the church is fire. The one persistent prayer of them that cry and sigh is for a fiery baptism of Pentecost. The baptism of the Spirit is a baptism of fire. Spirit-filled souls are ablaze for God. They love with a love that glows. They believe with a faith that kindles. They serve with a devotion that consumes. They hate sin with a fierceness that burns. He is also the powerful presence. How much we speak about a life of power. Well, it is the sequel to a life of purity. It is impurity that detracts from power. But it is the pure altar on which the fire burns that then becomes the powerful influence. And Jesus said to his disciples, Tarry until ye be endued with power from on high. Ye shall receive power. And Pentecost, as we think about it today, is a day of thinking about divine power coming upon the people of God. Not all who believed were in the upper room. After his resurrection, Jesus saw 500 brethren at one time. But there weren't 500 people in the upper room. It was 120. The other 380 missed out. I wouldn't want to miss out on the visitation of the Spirit, would you? I would want to be there whenever he comes. That's what Evan Roberts said. I want to be there when he comes in revival in Wales. And so from 13 years of age till 23 years of age, he was at every prayer meeting he could be at until and just if the event would happen. And he was there when it did. And God met with him. And then he became the revivalist under God. And his life became that vessel of power with the river of God flowing through it out over the land of Wales, bringing tens of thousands to Jesus Christ. Could there be an Evan Roberts? Like Evan Roberts? Could there be a young life today that is at the Master's feet and you're saying, Lord, take my life and make it wholly thine. And come to me in all thy fullness, Take possession of my soul. Take the will I scarce can yield thee. Sanctify and cleanse the whole. I am waiting. I am willing. Thine and only thine to be. Make my heart thy living temple. Come today and dwell in me. A.B. Simpson was a wonderful man of God, and I made a little note of something that he said, and with this I want to draw to a conclusion. Oh, beloved, we are living in an earnest age, and surely the Holy Ghost ought to produce earnest men and women today. God, give us the power. I like this. I meditated on it this morning. God, give us the power that will multiply our lives until they measure up to the extraordinary opportunities and to the marvelous possibilities of these last days. God, give us the power. Give me that power that will multiply my life until it measures up to the extraordinary opportunities and to the marvelous possibilities of these last days. Oh, for a race of Pauls. Oh, for an army of Gideons. Oh, for a band of heroes. Oh, for an endowment of the Holy Ghost and all the meaning of Pentecost and in all the highest 
thought of Christ himself. My friends, that to me is majestic language. That to me is a deep heart appeal from the very depths of the soul of a man whose life touched a multitude. A.B. Simpson. Who will put their life on the line this week, these coming meetings, and say, O Holy Ghost, revival comes from Thee. Send a revival. Start the work in me. Thy word declares, Thou wilt supply my need for blessing now, O Lord. I humbly plead. Yes, the residency of the Spirit is a reality in every saved soul. But the presidency of the Spirit is the possession of those who have had their own personal Pentecost. My blessed Lord, by thy Spirit, be the resident but today, be the president. Come and take possession of the oval room of my life and speak thy most important messages from the altar of that room to my life. Amen. Let's pray together. O oh, loving Lord Jesus, today, in these brief flying moments, we thank and praise Thee for the living Spirit of God, the sevenfold lamps of the Spirit that burn with an incandescent blow, uh, flow, uh, glow, that burn up all the trace of sin and bring the light and glory in. O oh Lord, we pray with the hymn, The Revolution Now Begins. Send the fire, oh, send the fire. And in Jesus' name I pray this morning, knowing that the Comforter has come. Lord, we pray today that we might be able to say from the depths of our hearts, He has come to me in all His fullness. Lord, I pray this morning, write Thy word into all our hearts and be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.